Hello. Our story begins in 3967 BBY, when a disturbance changed the balance of the Force. Anakin Skywalker was born in an Outer Rim Territory world shortly before the beginning of the Mandalorian Wars. The Jedi had been avoiding war with Mandalore, and the Republic itself was nearly engaged with the Mandalorian enemy. In 3964 BBY, there was a young 30-year-old Jedi by the name of Revan, who also went by the name the Revengist. He was well respected by the Galactic Republic and by the Jedi as well. His friend Alec and him were beginning a new movement within the Jedi Order. Revan believed that the Jedi should participate in the Mandalorian Civil War and aid the forces of the Galactic Republic, Revan having gained the nickname by the Republic media as the Jedi's own crusader. Being that Revan was openly vocal about his opinion, he began to rally together Jedi in his cause to fight against the Mandalorians and assist the Republic in this war with Mandalore. Revan tried to persuade the Jedi High Council to allow him and his followers to fight against the Mandalorians on behalf of the Jedi Order, but the Jedi Council didn't allow it. They believed that the Jedi shouldn't be involved in a political war. The Jedi didn't serve the Senate, they served the people of the galaxy, and they couldn't logistically be involved in a war against the Republic or the Mandalorians. Their belief was grounded, and it wouldn't change, but Revan was a rebel. He wasn't going to simply allow the Council to tell him and his followers that they couldn't do what they wanted to do. Sure, it wasn't the Jedi way, but Revan wasn't exactly very Jedi-like himself. He was trained by a number of different Jedi Masters, and there he was, a Jedi Knight, leading a small coalition of Jedi followers to break past the will of the Jedi Council. Revan just arrived outside of Tarist, inside of the Adjuster Sector. Revan was bringing down his followers here before they went out to scout out the Mandalorian positions in an effort to aid the Republic. While on Tarist, Revan met up with Jedi Master Lucian Dre in an effort to recruit more Jedi to his cause. There was a Jedi Tower on Tarist, but there were no other Jedi willing to join him. It's not even that Master Dre was obeying the will of the Council. He and his fellow Jedi just simply had no interest in aiding the Galactic Republic, and so they declined. Though there was one thing that Master Dre had for Revan. A child had been born on the planet Taurus a few years beforehand. This child had the highest midichlorian count ever collected since the Jedi ever interacted with the Ones. Master Dre believed this child could be the one to bring balance to the Force. He also knew that Revan was essentially the pride of the Jedi Order. He had what seemed to be limitless potential, and Master Dre believed that this child would be better fit with Revan than here at the Jedi Tower on Taurus. While it was a Jedi Academy, it was also more like a satellite campus, and it was a bit too close to this Mandalorian war going on in the galaxy. The Jedi were slowly moving younglings off-planet in fear of a confrontation with the Mandalorians or even the Republic. It was a slow effort, and it wasn't exactly going anywhere, and Master Dre believed that Revan, being so influential, would likely be back at Coruscant before any of these other younglings could be removed from the tower. Revan was a bit neglectful of this idea, but he gave in. The only reason being that, if he was going to be away from Coruscant, he could possibly help train the future of the Jedi Order. There was something unnerving about all of it for Revan. At this point in his life, he had no intention of being a Jedi Master. But if it was the Chosen One, then the Chosen One should be with him and his followers, rather than the Jedi Council and Coruscant, being that they themselves were neglectful of this conflict. Revan, if wise enough, could guide the child into being more than just the Chosen One, but the sole bringer of peace and harmony in the galaxy. Revan took the child, wrapped in garments, into his hands, and walked back into the vessel he and his followers arrived in. Not long after the Revan just left Taurus, they were attacked by the first Watch Circle of the Jedi Covenant, which killed all their students in the Padawan Massacre of Taurus. One of them survived and escaped, but Revan wouldn't learn about this for a long while. It wouldn't be long after the Padawan Massacre that Cassus Fett invaded the planet and took the tower for his own. Regardless, Revan took his followers to the planet of Surja, while he himself, along with the child Anakin Skywalker, which was situated in a Jedi pod, investigated Mandalorian activity on Onderon and its moon of Duxon. This was the first reconnaissance mission for the two of them, but it built up a bond between Revan and the child. Because these missions to Onderon's system were nothing but recon, it gave Revan time to simply just talk to Skywalker. Revan knew that the Force worked in mysterious ways. He himself had memories of when he was a child, and he knew that whatever he said could likely stick to the mind of Anakin, being that he was so powerful with the Force after all. So, the early lessons involved Revan just ranting about how the Force worked and how it operated. The Force was simply incredible, because it didn't bend to the will of either party, not the light nor the dark. Anakin's presence in the Force would only encourage the darkness to rise in an attempt to beat him. During their first mission, they would see very little traces of any Mandalorians, though he did learn that his friends and followers had all been captured on the planet of Surja, which meant he needed help. 
When Revan and Skywalker returned to Coruscant, Revan would keep Anakin a secret, while at the same time, revealing his findings from Onderon and Dexon. He would also disclose that the Revan just were captured on Surja, after an ambush made by the Mandalorians. This wouldn't give Revan any result that he wanted, especially after the Order reaffirmed their feelings about the Jedi Order staying out of the Mandalorian War with the Galactic Republic. Revan brought back Anakin inside of his vessel and departed for Surja alone. He was genuinely upset, ranting to himself, and therefore by inclusion, Anakin. Revan stopped when he noticed the child and remembered that he had the Chosen One with him. Revan told Anakin that the Jedi weren't always right. They did make mistakes, and this was one of them. While yes, Revan did disobey orders, and his followers suffered because of it, their inability to act left thousands and maybe millions in the wake of destruction. Revan spoke to Anakin and said it slowly and clearly, that the will of the Council was not always the will of the Force. They would save Alec and the other Jedi, and then from there they would go on to fight the Mandalorians who have already caused so much carnage in the galaxy. When Revan arrived, he would keep Anakin secured, and he would confront the Mandalorians, freeing his followers from the Mandalorian scientist Demogul. The Revan Chiss would begin a campaign galaxy-wide to encourage the Jedi to get involved in the war, and the Republic media would eat it up, referring to this as the Revan Chiss movement, the leader of this movement being referred to as the Revan Chiss. For a year, they would continue provoking the Jedi to make a move on the war, to join the Republic, and to fight back these Mandalorians. If they didn't, then more people would suffer. Currently, Revan and his followers were on the planet of Cathar, under the assumption that the disappearance of the entire planet species had a direct relationship to the barbaric, warlike nature of the Mandalorians. While they were on the planet, Revan felt a disturbance. This disturbance was alerted by Anakin. The child for the past year rarely made any noises or talked. He was a quiet kid, and Revan and his followers enjoyed his presence, but this was a ferocious scream. When Revan heard Anakin, his mind was taken away from Cathar, and immediately taken to pain. Mandalore the Ultimate, leader of the Mandalorian forces, led an attack on Sirico. The Mandalorians bombarded the entire surface of the planet and killed thousands within minutes. The cries of terror and pain echoed through the Force and it shook Revan and Skywalker to their core. This was the first real show of Force that Anakin had ever used. As a child, there was very little that he could actually do, and at this point, there was very little that the Jedi could do to intervene on Sirico. For several months, Revan and his followers would bounce around the Outer Rim territories until they returned to Cathar and had a collective vision. Their Force vision depicted the massacre of the people of Cathar. The Mandalorians, under the leadership of Cassus Fett, executed the Cathar because they dishonored the Mandalorians during the Great Sith War. There was an individual Mandalorian depicted defending the Cathar, and he too was executed for trying to stand against Cassus Fett. Cassus saluted the efforts of the lone Mandalorian, and then everyone of the Cathar and the singular Mandalorian were executed. The Mandalorian who stood up to Cassus Fett had one piece of his helmet retrieved by Revan himself. Revan was inspired by the sacrifice of the Mandalorian, and so he made a vow to wear the mask until the Mandalorians paid for what they did. Revan would take the information back to the Council on Coruscant and inform them of what happened on Cathar and Serico. At this point, the Jedi Council could no longer neglect the atrocities committed by the Mandalorians. Genocide was against their code of ethics, and so they unwillingly steered the Jedi Order into war with the Mandalorians on the side of the Galactic Republic. And while the Jedi publicly denounced Revan and his followers, Revan was a very intelligent individual. Recalling a move made by civilians during the Great Sith War, Revan would propose to the Council that the Revanchists act as official Republic military enforcers, though they would be labeled as Mercy Corps, representatives of the Republic and of the Jedi. And so begrudgingly, the Jedi Council allowed the Mercy Corps to be left under the command of Revan. He would tell Anakin about all these events, and while Anakin was still just a child, this information could prove to be vital for the child at some point in his life. Revan carried on, and in the following weeks, the Revanchist Jedi would join the Republic military in operations against the Mandalorians. Revan was told by Malak and even one of his most valuable lieutenants in Metra Surik that they should place Skywalker inside the Jedi Temple on Coruscant to keep him safe. Though Revan was beyond confident in his abilities, his confidence would be duly received as he won a string of victories for the Republic for the next year. In 3962 BBY, Revan and Malak would prevent the Battle of Dura from becoming an absolute catastrophe. The two Jedi would use a fleet of Interdictor-class cruisers to the planet to prevent Mandalorian Starcraft from escaping with the spoils of war. Considering there were great shipyards above Duro, the Mandalorian raid was successful until Revan's strategy shattered their plans. Unsuspectingly, Revan would be rewarded by the Supreme Chancellor of the Galactic Republic, Intel Cressa, who named Revan the Supreme Commander of the Galactic Republic military, which granted Revan one-third of the entire military of the Republic. 
The Jedi Knight was genuinely surprised, but he took the gift in with open arms. Revan's genius strategy didn't go unnoticed by the Republic, and with Malak and Skywalker there by his side, there was little that could really stop him. While the Mandalorians had made a solidified push against the Republic, Revan slapped back, and the Republic, counter assault, began to resist the warriors of Mandalore. Though the reason the Republic was able to win so much is because Revan knew the importance of the Republic industrial complex. Mandalore was a small grouping of planets and moons that resisted a galactic superpower. So, Revan used that to his advantage by sacrificing resources and territory to undermine their opponents. Revan and Malak referred to this as a moral shortcut, which inevitably became more warlike and less Jedi-like. With Anakin and a small Jedi pod following them around, these warlike tendencies would be plastered to the inside of his mind. The reason Revan and Malak became so cruel was because the Mandalorians didn't play nice, and to beat the Mandalorians, he had to be just as brutal and merciless as they proved to be. The continuous war effort would have Revan and Malak across the galaxy for two years, fighting the Mandalorians on every front. During that time, Revan, Malak, and Skywalker, who was seven years old at this point, discovered an ancient Sith ruin near the Jedi Enclave on Dantooine. It was the ruins of the Rakata species, and they discovered a star map, which led to a space station called the Starforge. Anakin being so young and asking questions about everything, such as why is the sky blue, wanted to know everything about the space station, but there was little knowledge to be shared. Another piece of the map would be discovered on Kashyyyk, in the depths of the Shadowlands, though this is when Revan began to take his young student on a path to the dark worlds of the Sith. Of course, Malak was with them when they visited Korriban and Malachor V. On Malachor, Revan discovered a learning academy of the Sith, and he introduced himself and Skywalker to the dark arts, and began began to use them, not long after Revan introduced Malak to the dark side of the force. Revan and Anakin specifically would practice with the dark side. By this point, even at seven years old, Anakin did have a Jedi weapon, though he didn't use it in active combat. He simply had it for practice with Revan. The bond between Revan and Anakin did sideline Malak a little bit, but Malak respected the bond between the two, and didn't do anything to get in the way of it. And while they were all using the dark side, rather actively, they did not renounce the ways of the Jedi Order. The Jedi would return to Taurus to confront the Mandalorians who had taken over the planet, and when they were there, they were able to save a number of slaves that had been captured by the Mandalorians, slaves that were about to be sold on the galactic black market. And while their victories were many, there was one Mandalorian lieutenant that was able to beat the two Jedi, that being Cassus Fett, at the Jagas Cluster. Revan responded quickly by having his own lieutenant, Metra Surik, attack Onderon and Dexon which were both housing Mandalorian strongholds at this point. This was difficult for Metra to do because her forces were weakened in comparison. The Battle of Dixon was a several month siege that saw every 10 Republic troopers die for every one Mandalorian death. Because of this terrible loss, Revan decided to launch a campaign on Althir III to draw the Mandalorians out. While Metra was struggling on Dixon, he was building a massive super weapon called the Mass Shadow Generator, which was essentially the centerpiece of a trap that was in the Malachor system for the Mandalorians. Despite the loss of Dixon, Metra would be placed in command of half the fleet as a means to draw the Mandalorians to Malachor. Revan would leave Anakin out of this, believing that the battle with the Mandalorians would be their final stand against the Republic. On his way back, Revan was sidetracked by a Mandalorian scouting party that pushed him off course. When he dealt with them, he arrived over Malachor to see a massive fleet battle taking place, though Mandalore the Ultimate knew that defeat was inevitable for his people, so naturally, he challenged Revan to one-on-one -on -one combat on his flagship. Revan accepted this, and he fought the Mandalorian warrior. Mandalore the Ultimate was a prideful warrior, and he held his own, but against the likes of Revan, he was no match. When he was cut down, he removed his helmet and informed Revan that he and the Mandalorians were manipulated by a red-skinned Sith into beginning this war with the Republic. The Sith convinced them to uncover a Sith tomb on the planet Rakid, and shortly after that, they engaged the Republic. Revan was given the coordinates before the warrior died. As a trophy, Revan took the mask from the Mandalorian warrior, and then he watched as the mask shadow generator was activated. The Republic was going to win anyways, but when the gravity vortex opened up, it dragged vessels from both fleets down into the surface of the planet, crushing them all. There were thousands of losses, but the Mandalorians suffered the most of the casualties, and they transmitted their unconditional surrender to the Republic after their loss at Malachor. Revan would bring the seven-year-old Anakin Skywalker with him to Mandalore, where he would order the them to give up their weapons and their armor, forcing many of them to become bounty hunters and mercenaries. At the same time, Anakin completed a project that Revan had been working on at the same time in his spare time. Revan was genuinely impressed that the child was able to complete it, but Skywalker was incredibly talented, and so, 
Revan used HK-47 to target and assassinate opponents so that he wouldn't have to repeat the same mistakes at Malachor V. While Revan and Malak were making the Mandalorians reap their actions, Metra Surik lost her connection to the Force, and so, she answered to the Jedi Council for her actions. She tried to get Revan and Malak to answer for their crimes as well, but they didn't, claiming to be chasing down Mandalorians in the Unknown Regions. But that wasn't the truth. Revan took his forces to the Unknown Regions for another reason. He, Malak, and Anakin would descend to the planet Rakid to investigate what Mandalore the Ultimate had mentioned before his death over Malachor. The three discovered the tomb of Sith Lord Dramath II, and there was also a Datacron inside of its sarcophagus. Inside the Datacron was information of the planet named Nathema. Before leaving, Revan left Mandalore the Ultimate's mask inside of Dramath's sarcophagus to ensure that the Mandalorians would never find it. The three then moved quickly to Nathema inside the Trelorian sector. The entire planet was barren from the Force, but its secrets were limitless, such as the tale of Darth Vitiate the Immortal. They learned that he had been around since the time of the Great Hyperspace War, which happened thousands of years beforehand. Anakin was more enthralled with this information, more so than Revan or Malak. His interest led them to have to learn about the ritual of Lathema, which is why the entire planet was barren of life, though it did give Vitiate immortality. The Sith Emperor had gathered younger generations of Sith before him. Revan and Malak became obsessed with finding the Sith threat, and they followed a trail from the Sith survivors to the world of Drummond Kaas, where they would find the capital of the reconstructed Sith Empire. The three of them would pose as mercenaries to avoid giving up the fact that they were Jedi. The three of them spent a number of months undercover. It was one of Anakin's earliest tests. A very difficult one at that. They learned that the Sith Empire planned on returning and launched an attack against the forces of the Light. The three Jedi didn't inform the Republic or the Jedi. They were confident. Revan had his young apprentice stay hidden until they returned with the Sith Lord's head in their hands. Malak and Revan departed, and Anakin waited in silence, listening to the sounds of heavy machinery bouncing around near him, and the sound of soldiers marching back and forth. It was all a bit daunting. Anakin closed his eyes and listened to the Force. When he did, he could hear Revan and Malak approaching the Emperor, until there was silence. Anakin heard two bodies drop to the floor. Anakin jolted up and ran towards the throne room, where he found Malak and Revan standing eerily quiet. Anakin slowed down, and before he could settle in and grab his Jedi weapon, he was thrown to his knees and sat down in front of the Sith Emperor. Vitiate dominated Anakin's mind in the same way he had the other two Jedi, twisting their minds and scouring their useful information, turning them into nothing but servants. Vitiate called them all three by name, Darth Revan, Darth Malak, and Darth Vader, telling the three of them to go back to the Republic as a vanguard to find the legendary Starforge. Once they won, they were to return back. Before they left, Vitiate showed his loyal servants, the three, and informed his people that these Sith had been Republic spies. Now, they had been executed in the depths of the Citadel. The three would depart, and by using the various star maps, would arrive at the conclusion that the legendary weapon was inside the Lahan system. Though when they got there, they crash-landed on the planet and were captured by a Rakata tribe. The Sith were unable to understand the language of these primitive beings, though after stealing information from the tribal leader, the Sith would make an exchange, which would grant Revan, Malak, and young Vader access to the Star Forge. Revan was able to become allies with the Rakatan Elders through this process. The only reason the Elders permitted Revan access to the ancient weapon was because of his promise to destroy it once he got access to it, which was a lie. Because the second the three of them got access, they turned the ancient weapon back on, and all of them having broken free of the Emperor's control, interpreted his darkness as their own thoughts and their own desires. This, of course, was untrue, but the dark side was ruthless and it convinced them of things they did not individually believe. Though, with this new weapon under their command, they would begin a new Sith Empire, and Malak would be Revan's apprentice, along that of Skywalker being his apprentice too. Vader was continuously tagging along and he felt left out from time to time on these missions. He did feel a certain level of resentment for his master because of how hard it was to get his genuine attention. This continued as Revan studied the Star Forge and realized that the weapon was more useful than just creating weapons. He took a fragment of the massive structure and left it on Nar Shada in care of a number of slaves, while using another fragment of the station to construct his own fleet. This is where tension arose between Master and Apprentice. Vader on the side had to watch Malak as he believed that his master was weak. The Sith Lord planned out a grand campaign against the Republic, one that would take 20 years to complete. But by the end of it, it would see the corruption uprooted and give him the ability to slide right into the cusp of power. 
Revan didn't want to hollow out the military structure or the government of the Republic, just the ones who wouldn't be loyal to him. While sure Revan was focused on his grand plan, his youngest apprentice sat behind the scenes and listened to every little thing that Revan did and said. Maybe it was a bit neglectful teaching, but it was better than nothing. Revan, having spent so much time inside the Republic military, knew the ins and outs. With the information he acquired over the years, he prepared for an attack on Forrest. The reason being is that the Republic had a number of warships stationed there. Revan, using his brilliant strategic skills, would barge into Forrest, capturing the most of the Republic warships and destroying the rest. One of the Republic officers, who looked up to Revan and liked him quite a bit, switched teams and joined the Sith Empire, becoming the Admiral and the commander of the entire Sith fleet in the process. The tension between Malak and Revan continued from there, as Malak ordered the Admiral to bombard Telus IV, which he did because he was listening to orders. However, Revan had every intention to conquer that planet before it was blown up. Vader watched this bickering and then he felt the tension. He initially sided with Revan, but he slowly began to take the side of Malak, especially as Malak took favorability with Vader and Revan's growth as a Sith Lord. So, what Malak did, while Revan was preparing his 20-year campaign, is he began to train Lord Vader. This was all a part of the plan, at least that's what Malak told Vader. In Vader's mind, he was doing what Revan wanted, which was to train under Malak until Revan had time to train him, so he accepted the path laid before him. Skywalker, being so young, did have tremendous power in the Force, and because he was essentially with the most powerful Sith in the galaxy, he picked up on all their lessons very well. Revan began to focus on executing politicians who didn't fit in his realm, and so HK-47 delivered their heads in a timely manner. Though the tension between Master and Apprentice broke out in the bridge deck in front of young Vader, the young Sith watched as Malak and Revan fought each other, seemingly to the death. Malak believed that Revan was too soft to be a true Sith Lord, and attempted to kill him for power over the Sith Empire. During the duel, Revan avoided strikes by his student and subsequently removed the jaw of Malak. Revan didn't kill Malak and made an example out of him in front of Vader. Revan told his young student that to walk the way of the Sith required balance. It required precision. A lack of that led to the inevitable defeat that Malak had faced. Revan shoved Malak to the floor and told him to clean up his act. Malak had to get himself a prosthetic jaw and a vocabulator so that he could speak. He'd have to wear this for the rest of his life, being that Revan's damage was permanent. While Vader rejoiced in some interaction between himself and Revan, he was immediately disappointed when Revan turned his attention to building HK-50 series droids on Telos IV due to the success of Anakin's work on HK-47. This disappointed Vader greatly, and he felt a true sense of resentment for his master, believing that Revan had truly betrayed him and left him out in the dirt. Vader would become closer to Malak and it wouldn't attract Revan's interest because truthfully he didn't notice. For three more years, Malak and Vader's bond would tighten and Revan would continue his pursuit of victory until the Jedi led him into a trap. A strike team of Jedi attacked Revan's flagship and surrounded him. Revan and Malak, having separate starships, were separated. Inside of Revan's bridge, he fought off Jedi warriors, killing several of them in the process until he was confronted by a Jedi Knight, Bastila Shan. Revan was an incredible duelist, but Bastila, having used battle meditation before this conflict, was ready to ice Revan and bring him back to the Jedi Temple. During their fight, Malak felt the tension in the Force. He stood on his bridge, and he put his hand on ten-year-old Vader's shoulder and pushed him to the front of the bridge. Malak told the crew to fire on Revan's cruiser. The crew obliged to Malak, as he turned towards Vader and told him that he would do everything that Revan couldn't. Malak would train Vader in the ways of the dark side and turn him into the ultimate threat in the galaxy. Revan's vessel exploded and the bridge shattered in front of Malak and Vader. Malak instantly assumed that he had killed his rival. And so, he redirected the fleet away from him. But Malak wasn't done his quest yet. A former Jedi was thrown from his feet behind the two Sith. Malak looked over at Vader and told him that to prove his usefulness, he'd have to kill this Jedi. Vader looked at his master and then over back at the adult Jedi. This Jedi, if he killed Vader, would become Malak's new apprentice, being named Darth Bandon. Of course, if he failed, then Malak would continue to train Vader, but he wanted to test out this new apprentice. The originally foreseen chosen one was ten years from birth, facing down a Jedi for the right to be heir to the Empire of the Sith. Vader ignited his weapon. Having been left in the dust by his former master on numerous occasions, this was his one chance right here to prove his worth to Lord Malak, so that he could be trained in the ways that he believed he should have been trained in. The issue for Vader was that he was always revered as his chosen one of the Jedi Order. However, he was consistently neglected. It felt like the only reason he and Revan ever bonded was because Revan was just ranting at him and not even engaging in conversation. One of the deckhands threw a lightsaber down in front of the Jedi. 
This particular Jedi had a quest for power, though he was locked up for the time being because he hadn't fully committed to the Dark Arts. This was his one opportunity to fully commit to them. If he did, then the galaxy could be his. If he didn't, then he would just simply die. The Dark Jedi rose to his feet and ignited his lightsaber. Vader stepped forward, slowly moving into the only form he really knew. Thanks to Revan and Malak's loose training, he had to essentially train himself with the little information he had. Though the neglect he faced fueled him, Vader's base form was a combination between 2 and 6, so he stepped forward. Bandon rushed the little child. He had no clue that Vader was meant to be the Chosen One or to fulfill some prophecy of the Jedi. The Order was 22,000 years old at this point. Anything could be made up. Bandon swung down and Vader moved out of the way, becoming a hard-to-hit target based on his size alone. Bandon turned around and yelled, swinging his lightsaber back and throwing it forward as Vader caught up with a parry and shoved forward. Vader may have been strong with the Force, but he was just a child. He had no chance at winning with physical dominance. The man grinned as the lightsabers screamed at each other, gliding across each other's surface. Bandon beat down on Vader, throwing him from his feet. Vader looked up and his face creased with anger. His eyes turned Sith yellow. Bandon didn't even take mind of this as he reached up and swung down. As he reached the ground where Vader was, the blade stopped. The lightsaber flipped out of his hand and he was lifted into the air as Vader shot electricity out of his hands. It was pure power from the dark side of the force and in moments it fried Bandon and he died within midair. Vader dropped him, grabbing his own lightsaber which had yet been bled, as he ignited the weapon and whipped it around at the deckhand, who gave the former Jedi a lightsaber. The blade caught the deckhand in the head, and Vader used the force to pull it back before turning it off and kneeling before his new master. Our story continues on Malak's personal vessel's bridge. Young Vader knelt before him. With Revan out of the picture, Malak would bring new power to the Sith. He would help restore the Sith Empire to its greatest glory, being that Malak believed his former master was inferior as a Sith. His plan, this new one, in mind would be flawless. Malak told Vader to rise and took his apprentice by his side, telling him that they would take over the entire galaxy. Vader looked up at his master and nodded his head. He felt the belonging he'd been searching for. However, he was kind of ticked off that Malak made him fight a grown man. Maybe it was all about perspective. Maybe it was simply that Anakin wasn't looking at it the right way. Like Malak believed that Vader was good enough to kill a Jedi, but he just wanted proof of it. Being 10 years old, it was a bit much and a bit hard to wrap his mind around, but Malak didn't have time to explain it. He turned to Vader and told him to vacate the bridge for the time being. He'd be summoned when Malak wanted him. Vader nodded his head and walked out of the bridge. The Sith Lord, on the other hand, departed from the Outer Rim territories. It was a trap specifically set for Revan, and he fell for it. Malak had a different idea anyways. He didn't agree with everything that Revan did, and he believed that Revan was weak, too weak to be a Sith. Malak believed that when they invaded planets, they should essentially glass the entire planet so that no one could use it. Revan's obsession with capturing a planet was ridiculous of an idea to Malak. He knew it wasn't feasible for the Sith to keep every planet they captured, so why let the Republic and the Jedi have a chance at utilizing them? The Sith fleet disappeared, and Malak began to realize that he needed more Force users to utilize the Star Forge to the best of its ability. Malak was going to bring carnage to the galaxy, and be the Sith Lord the galaxy needed. His fleet arrived outside of the Mustafar system. The planet bled with the dark side of the Force, though at this point in time, the entire planet was covered in lava. There wasn't a dry patch of land. He came here because it was the best place to station his fleet before dropping his fleet on a helpless Republic fleet. Malak knew just as well as Revan did that the Republic didn't have the forces capable to keep up with the Sith, not to mention that both Revan and Malak were both a part of the Republic military at one point, so they knew how to stop the Republic at just about any turn. When they arrived outside of Mustafar, Malak brought Vader to the bridge and showed him the entire planet below. Without a warning, Malak ignited a lightsaber and slashed at Vader. The young Sith dropped to the ground, barely missing being decapitated by his master. Vader ignited his own weapon and spun around to his feet. Malak beat his blade down on his young student. Vader fell to the ground. His master pointed the blade down at him and told him to get back up. Vader nodded his head and did so. The minute he did, he was thrown backwards into the window, Malak's strike throwing him from his feet. Malak kicked Vader while he was down and demanded that he get back up. Vader got back up slowly, as Malak was facing away from him, talking, monologuing if you will. The Sith Lord told his apprentice that he was teaching him how to be the best Sith he could be. There was a lot of potential within Vader, but if he didn't utilize it, then he would be nothing. To be a Sith took anger, it took strength. Vader clenched his fists, squeezing his blade within his hand, and he ran forward, and Malak slid to the slide, slashing down on Vader's blade and sliding the weapon up across Vader's arm, leaving a large cut across the arm. 
Vader fell to the ground and looked over at the blade which was beneath the boot of his master. Malak lowered his blade to his side, looking at his student with a bit of disappointment. He called out across the bridge to his student and told him to take it from him. Anakin held his arm out as he got back up and reached out his arm, latching onto the blade with the force and pulling it with as much strength as he could, but it didn't budge. Malak clenched his fist, yelling out across the room once more, telling Vader to use his anger. Vader clenched his jaw and pulled as hard as he could, but still, no movement. Malak then came up with a fun idea. Watching his student struggle, he wrapped the force around his student and told Vader that if he didn't get the lightsaber to defend himself, then he would die. Anakin looked at Malak and then realized that he no longer had control over his body's movements. Of course, he could still move his arms, but in terms of everything else, there was nothing he could do. Malak lifted Vader ever so slightly off of the floor and began the dragon forward. At the same time, Malak raised his lightsaber blade and pointed out directly in front of him. Vader began to panic, trying to get a hold of his blade, and then anger seeped into his soul. Malak's blade was getting closer and closer to his face, and the heat could be felt as meters turned into inches. When all looked lost on his new apprentice, Malak Malak's foot peeled up and the blade beneath him was ripped into Vader's hands. He smacked the blade against his masters, and the shock forced Malak to let go of his student with the force. Within an instant, Vader channeled all of his dark energy and flung Malak across the bridge into the window, cracking it, but Vader didn't stop. All his soul was red. He clenched his hands and Malak felt his jaw piece begin to shatter until it broke. The deckhands panicked, calling out to Vader that if he didn't stop, he would open up the entire bridge and kill everyone on board. Vader gritted his teeth, letting go of his master, as he dropped to the ground without the ability to speak. Vader's attention turned towards the deckhands. Fear sat in their eyes as all of them looked at Vader. Some of them accepted their mistakes, while a couple of them got up and began to run away. Vader reached out with his hands and electricity flashed out of his fingertips, burning the runaways to their bones. They crumbled to their knees and Vader walked forward, rejoicing in the sound of their suffering. Vader's head tilted almost robotically as he crept forward, shooting more electricity out of his hands and burning the men to death. When he felt their life force vanish, he turned to the other deckhands that told him to stop, to dispose of their bodies and then dispose of themselves. They shot up out of their seats and then ran to pick up the bodies. The moment Vader turned around, he saw his master. His eyes were left widened, and his expression was nothing short of flabbergasted. Malak couldn't say a word, being that his vocabulary was broken. Vader, on the other hand, fell to his knees. He was still ten years old. To use this much power was a shock even to him. Vader looked up and saw his master walking towards him, so he clenched his lightsaber, but he couldn't do anything. His breath was shaky and his vision was blurred, bouncing in and out of seeing multiple versions of his master. Malak patted his apprentice on the shoulders and walked out of the bridge towards his personal quarters. He had a lot of thinking to do. Malak knew that Vader was meant to be powerful, but this was more power than he originally thought he had to deal with. The fact that a ten-year-old boy could throw him across the room and hold him where he wanted him was alarming enough, not to mention that he would only grow in more power. Malik also noted how powerful his force lightning was. When he walked past the crew members, their bodies were burnt to a crisp. There wasn't an identifiable feature. They were just simply non-existent. The Sith Lord sat still while a medical droid replaced his missing jawline. He couldn't help but think about everything that had just transpired in front of him. Malik for a short moment felt fear, as if Vader at this very young age could simply just kill him. But maybe he wouldn't. Surely he wouldn't. If he did, who would take control of the Sith Empire he was building? Well, maybe Vader would. What could Malak do to reduce Vader's strength from growing without Vader feeling like he was withholding him from growing? He then got a good idea. He would have Vader watch with him as they destroyed their enemies. He would then have the Star Forge craft battle droids that would wield plasma staves, and then Vader could spar with them instead of himself. It would be a good outlet for Vader to get experience without Malak accidentally ticking him off and having his powers be unleashed against him. Skywalker, on the other hand, would remain on the bridge, as if he melted into the floor on the bridge. He stayed isolated, tugging on his own feelings about his master. He could sense Malak's fear. He could also feel the fear of those around him, and he fed off of it. The Force was strong with him, and he wasn't a Sith Lord yet. Surely, he would have no issue with becoming one, though. Vader turned his head to a deckhand walking in front of the bridge. He was putting a maintenance request in to make sure that the bridge didn't break whenever they went to hyperspace. Vader's eyes shot open and the man's body turned cold. He looked at Vader and stopped his movement. Vader closed his eyes again and felt the fear wash over the deckhand. How pale his skin got when he looked into the eyes of the Sith Apprentice. For 24 hours, Master and Apprentice would be separated, though that would be very intentional because Malak was strategizing on how he could handle this student. 
When he eventually returned to the helm of the bridge, he was surprised to see that the student was still sitting there. He walked up and asked the captain to reroute the fleet to the Star Forge so that they could procure more reinforcements for the fleet and for the army. He nodded his head, and within moments, the fleet was sent into hyperspace. Malik stood in the front of the bridge, looking at the fixed panel that was nearly shattered by his temperamental student. While he was standing there, he felt cold, more cold than he did when he first met the Sith Emperor. When he turned around, he looked into the piercing yellow eyes of his student. Vader didn't move his eyes, just stared into Malik's soul. Vader wasn't doing anything aggressive, just observing. He realized his power, and he spent the last several hours focusing on the dark side of the Force. This was the first time Malik ever saw Anakin with yellow eyes, and the fear that covered his soul filled Skywalker with more power. He fed off of Malik's terror, and he felt power course throughout his veins. Vader got to his feet and walked up to his master and simply looked at him. Malik didn't say a word until a student asked what they were going to do at the Star Forge. Malik repeated his earlier statement, and then Vader questioned what they were really going there for. Malik knew that Vader knew something, so he said that they would be getting Vader some training droids. Vader's reaction showed Malik that the power dynamic between Master and Apprentice had shifted. Malik was on his heels and he couldn't be overbearing to a menace that could, as shown, very easily dispose of him. When they eventually arrived outside of the Star Forge, Malik used the captured Jedi to fuel the massive machine and produce more vessels and more battle droids for his army. When all was said and done, they departed back towards the Outer Rim so that they could deal with the Jedi and the Republic. Vader was aware of another fear that his master had. Malak feared an encounter with a Jedi who led an assault on his former master. But still, Ashan was out there somewhere, and he really didn't like the idea of facing her. The biggest thing for Malak was capturing her and defeating her so that he could turn her to the dark side or, of course, kill her. Of course, there were motivations for the idea of turning her to the dark side. It would be the best way for him to deal with the menace of an apprentice he had for himself. With the reorganized fleet, Malak's forces arrived at Triton and caught the Republic off guard. Their fleet was nothing in comparison, and Malik made sure that they were well aware of that. He plastered their fleet, and then he did something that Vader hadn't seen Revan do, which was an instructional moment for Vader. His master brought him to the front of the bridge and showed him. Vader looked outside the window and watched as hundreds of wings of fighters departed through the rubble of the Republic fleet towards the surface of the planet. Malik turned to Vader and told him that the weakest part about Revan was his inability to crush any chance of resistance. Destroying the surface of these planets would reduce territory that the Republic could occupy. Vader turned back towards his master and questioned him, asking why they would destroy territory if they couldn't have it either. It defeats the purpose of conquest. Malik spoke down to his student and told him that the dark side is fueled by pain. If it's fueled by pain and people suffer, then they as Sith would surely be empowered. Vader again spoke back, wanting to know why or how how at all it would be effective for them. Malik grabbed his apprentice by the jaw and turned his head towards the rubble of the skies. The destroyers were passing through the rubble in space and lowering themselves towards the atmosphere of the planet. While the ship passed through the rubble, bodies and debris bounced off the hull of the ship. Malik shoved Vader's face out of his grip and turned back towards the front of the bridge. When they got to the atmosphere, he spoke up, telling Vader to take in all the suffering. The people below couldn't defend themselves without the Republic and without defense, they were slaughtered. Vader nodded his head, and because Malik was ticked off, he told a student to go to the training room and begin his session early. They would stop when Malik was tired. Vader nodded his head once more, with anger bellowing under his skin. He didn't care for his master, and he had plans to overthrow him. All the feelings that Anakin had dissipated once he embraced the way of the Sith. Originally, Anakin wanted to have some sense of vulnerability with his teachers. He wanted to be accepted by Revan and Malak, and now he would force people to accept him. He would break people's wills, and that included that of his master. He didn't want Malak to die. He simply wanted Malak to share his pain, the pain that languished in ever since they embraced the dark side of the Force. When Anakin went to the training room, he began fighting with the training droids. After three hours, his master would walk in and find him coated in sweat, and then Malak would force him to go until the droids beat him to the ground, stunning him and leaving him incapacitated. When the spars were over and Vader was knocked out, Malak would leave and allow his student to recover, which due to the intensity of the training droids' plasma stabs could leave Skywalker pass out on the cold floor anywhere for three hours to twelve hours. It was a brutal way of being trained by his master, but Vader embraced it in his own sick way. He saw this as a means to get as good as he could so that he could eradicate his master. Not to mention that Vader had stolen a Sith holocron from Malak's room without Malak noticing it. Anakin then used a holocron to obtain information that his master was withholding from him. Some of the abilities ranged from typical, while others were more intense. One of Vader's more personal favorites was the Force Drain. It wasn't a typical Force Drain. It was one that removed an individual's ability to use a Force at all. 
The other force drain took life away, and Vader didn't want to do that. He wanted to absorb his master's ability to use the force, and then he would make him work for him as a grunt, with all the other common people who worked on their vessels. It would diminish his master's sense of worth and ability to feel confidence at all. The entire purpose of such ability for Vader was to relish in Malak's suffering. He didn't care what Malak did, because he couldn't do anything to stop him if he did it. The only issue is Vader could only do it to very weak people. Because everyone had the ability to use a force, or everyone had the force in them, Vader figured out how to take the force away from regular people. However, someone like Malak had a lot more midichlorians than the typical deckhand. It was odd to watch for Vader once he took people's midichlorians. He noticed it, but Malak never did. Vader would note how different the individuals who lost their midichlorians would act. They would be a bit more dull, like their life had been taken away from them without it actually being taken away from them. A body without a soul, if you will. They simply did their task like a protocol droid. Their personalities died out and they became lifeless. For a weak force sensitive individual, this was the case. Vader didn't realize that if he did it to someone like Malak or Jedi, for example, they would just retain their personality and their emotions. However, they would just become normal. They would be them, just without the ability to use a force effectively. Regardless, the clockwork of the Sith fleet was insane. They were repetitively bouncing on and off worlds within the span of a week. Every week, a new Republic fleet was demolished and dismantled, and every week, a planet was turned from a prosperous civilization into nothingness. Vader enjoyed it because it did grant him new power. However, he thought it was simply a waste, especially because the only thing Malak didn't waste were the Force Sensitives he captured. There were Jedi on every planet or in every fleet. His main objective was to capture them and then he would do it himself. Using the training droids, he would hunt down the Jedi and capture as many as he could without killing all of them. After every assault, he would bring them back to the Star Forge and increase the size of their fleet and his armies. It was a simple task for him, and wholeheartedly he enjoyed killing off his rivals in the Force. After Malak and Vader watched the destruction of Christophsis, Malastare, Naboo, Rodia, Falene, Saifar, and Calabra, Malak would send Vader to the Star Forge. There would be a real reason for this. He feared Vader. Malak could feel Vader's strength in the Force growing with each and every passing victory. Every genocide was accomplished by growth in Vader's rage, and especially in his strength. The way Malak would phrase it is that Vader was going to protect the Star Forge from the Jedi. That wasn't why he was going there. It was just because he didn't want to be around him. Word had it that Bastila Shan, Revan, and some Republic hero were trying to locate the legendary weapon. Malak made it sound like Vader was in charge of a very defensive operation, and he was stationed at the station with 200 of the powerful training droids. Malak knew that Vader would destroy a couple of them in his training, but that wasn't the point. The point was that if the Jedi came, then he would have extra reinforcements to help him. Vader knew what his master was doing. At this point, he was a proud 11-year-old. Vader allowed Malak to think that he was deceiving him and went along with the program. There was a real reason for this. Once Malak disappeared, Vader did too. Once Malak was gone, Vader used a little bit of his force essence to create himself a hyper-fast starfighter with a bit of cargo space so that he could investigate former Sith home worlds. Vader knew that he would spend his days and time wisely, and he could find more artifacts that belonged to the Sith before him. With his mind set, Vader would disappear from the Star Forge. The first planet he went to was Exegol. It was on an ancient homeworld of the Sith. The biggest reason he went here first was because he had a Sith Wayfinder inside of his room, and the Wayfinder led him here. It was one of the only kind things that Revan ever did for him. It was a gift from Revan. He stole it from the Sith Emperor on Draman Kaz. When Vader got to Exegol, he found the Magnificent Temple, yet it was barren, aside from the relics of a time before him. Though there was something he found especially interesting, and it was that here on Exegol, there was a religion of Sith loyalists called the Sith Eternal. Vader was extremely excited when he found out about them, but immediately disappointed once he realized that these were useless beings that held no ability to use a force whatsoever. However, he would eventually return. He saw a magnificent throne fit for him, and he would simply take it for himself. Why wouldn't he? Vader departed from Exegol towards the next location, which landed him on the planet of Yavin 4. When he got to the planet, he found himself at a location dedicated to one of the few prominent Sith Lords that came before his master. It was Exar Kun's tomb. And so, he ventured down into the tomb and found himself some texts. Vader would spend an elongated period here, learning everything he could, and then, when he thought he was finished, he found himself a Sith holocron. It was Exar Kun's holocron. There had to be so much information within this holocron, so he took the little crystal of knowledge and departed back to Lehan, where the Star Forge was. When he returned, he could feel something that was off in the Force. He wasn't really sure what it was, so he spent a couple days trying to concentrate on the Force to feel what it was, but after three days in silence, he found the answers. While he had been away, the Jedi had accidentally found themselves in the hands of Malak's flagship. 
Revan had survived. He was captured by Bastila Shan. The three of them were tortured by Malik. One of the crew members on Malik's flagship freed them. As they tried to escape, they confronted Malik. The Republic hero, known as Anasai, was thrown to the side by Malik and then confronted the two apparent Jedi. But first he informed Revan that he was being controlled by Bastila and the Jedi Council. They were simply just using him. To which, at this point, Bastila confirmed that they had wiped his memories. But her reasoning was much different. Malik tried convincing Revan that the Council was using him as a puppet, whereas Bastila told him that she was only trying to redeem him and save the galaxy from the monster that sat across from them. Revan understood Bastila and he forgave her, which turned Malik into a rage-filled man, trying to kill the three of them. And while Revan hadn't yet returned to his full power, he was able to hold his own against Malik for an extended period of time, until Shan sacrificed herself for the Jedi and helped Revan and Ansai escape. However, she was captured by Malik and brought back to his flagship. Malik would spend the longer part of a couple weeks torturing her until her mind was broken and she swore allegiance to Malik. Shan would be informed by Malik that their main goal was to defeat his current apprentice. When she learned that Vader was just 11 years old, she found it ridiculous that he would be so worried about a child, but she was perfectly fine with offing off Darth Vader. Bastila and Malik would begin a new master and apprenticeship bond, and Vader could feel it. Rage seethed through his entire being. He was betrayed more than once, and he didn't believe he could be stopped from killing his former master whenever he arrived. Vader had all the forces he needed, however, he was going to make sure that he personally killed his master. Truthfully, Vader had enough force to create himself a fleet larger than anything Malak could ever amass. However, he wanted the pleasure of wringing Malak's neck with his own lightsaber. It would bring him nothing but pleasure, so instead of mounting up his defenses, he would wait patiently for his master and this new apprentice of his to arrive at the Star Forge of Leon. It wouldn't take long for Vader to feel his master's presence once again, and they arrived at a hyperspace. When the fleet arrived, Vader didn't budge. He waited quietly as the shuttle pulled into the hangar bay and landed. Bastila walked out in front of Malik, and the two of them ignited their lightsabers. The 11-year-old boy opened up his eyes and looked forward. He got to his feet and ignited his own weapon. The two Sith ran at him. Vader leapt between the two of them, spinning his blades around in front of him, blocking two strikes before dispersing Malik with the Force. Bastila growled at him, ignited the second part of her lightsaber, and began a fast-paced assault on the young Sith. Vader was on a backpedal, defending himself every chance he got, which was getting increasingly harder against the older Sith. He was shoved from his feet. Just because Vader didn't have the physical strength didn't mean he didn't have the Force power to keep himself in this. Vader deignited his weapon and reached out with the Force. Vader deignited his weapon and reached out with the Force and dragged the shuttle of the two Sith that they arrived in across the floor into Bastila. He got to his feet and used all of his force to shove the massive ship against the wall with Bastila pinned against the side of it. The vessel exploded and before he could rejoice, his master was above him. His lightsaber placed in front of him where it could land the killing blow on his apprentice. Vader growled when he saw it, reaching his hand up and shooting lightning into Malik and throwing him across the hangar bay and slamming him into the wall. Vader looked to his side, and from the fire emerged the Sith apprentice Bastila Shan. She looked a little upset, which who wouldn't be if they were slammed into a wall with a shuttle on top of them. She ignited her lightsaber and ran forward. Vader turned his attention towards her, his glowing yellow eyes piercing through her soul. He shot lightning at her and she blocked it, before swinging at him. Vader dropped to the floor and she slid across the floor. Vader got back to his feet, igniting his lightsaber to defend himself from her rage. He may have been in the darkness longer than her, however, she had much more experience as a Force user. The two of them got into a heated exchange. Vader was talented, but he was struggling. Bastila could see how much he was struggling. She ripped her blade across, cutting his face while he was still holding his blade out, she cut off his dominant forearm. As he reeled from the pain, she lifted him up from the ground and threw him into the fire behind him. Malak got to his feet and applauded his apprentice. Vader's forearm and lightsaber sat idle on the ground. Malak grinned, reaching out with the force, but not being able to pull the weapon from the ground. His eyebrows tightened and he reached out with more of his strength, trying to pull the weapon from the ground. All of a sudden, the blade tipped down the line of the hangar bay, flying towards the fire of the shuttle. When Malak looked up, he looked into the eyes of his apprentice. A chill ran down his and Bastila's spines. The lightsaber ignited, and he stepped forward, with revenge on his face. Vader was furious, but he was missing his dominant arm against two adult Sith. If he himself was grown up, surely this wouldn't be a challenge for him, but it was now. Malak and Bastila's weapons shot on again, and they stepped towards the former Sith apprentice. Vader focused on the Force, ripping panels off the floor and throwing them at the Sith. Bastila was smacked by one of them, and the sharp edge of the panel lodged itself into her thigh. She fell over in incredible pain. Malak didn't stop, he just kept going. Vader raised his blade up, but Malak wouldn't stop, swinging down relentlessly until he broke through Anakin's defense, impaling Anakin in the upper chest near his shoulder with the blade. 
Malik spun around, kicking Skywalker across the face, knocking him out and then throwing him from his feet. Malik would activate the droids and have them lock Vader away. As for Bastila, he would send her down to the surface of Lahan. When Anakin was unconscious, everything would change. When he woke up, he would be in a completely different place, surrounded by different people. When his eyes opened, he looked down at a white bed. His forearm was replaced with a metallic limb. He moved it up and down, flexing his fingers, and then he heard a familiar voice. Young Skywalker turned his head over towards a door. A bright light was shining in from the door, and a silhouette walked in. The voice sounded familiar, but the words weren't wording. They were slowly being pieced together, and then the face became visible. It was Revan. Our story continues inside of a small medical bay of a Republic cruiser. Vader was locked down to the medical bay table, and next to him was the gentle voice of Revan. Vader hadn't heard this voice since before their little journey to Drama and Kaz. Vader's Sith eyes still sat prevalent in his face. He ripped and tugged at the bed, but he couldn't free himself. Revan placed his hand on Anakin's shoulder and filled his mind with a blinding light. Anakin jolted back into the bed, and his mind went to a memory transferred over from Revan. The reformed Jedi watched Anakin's body twitch as he passed in the past year of his life into Skywalker's mind, everything from his mind wiping to the resurgence of his memories when he was told about the truth from Bastila and Malak, all the way to his final encounter with his former friend and his former student. What had happened was a complete change in Revan, and after a year-long journey across the galaxy with Bastila and a couple of other individuals he befriended, he learned a lot about himself. Of course, Revan didn't remember everything from before his mind wiping, but for the most part of the past year, he knew what was going on. Anakin watched Revan's journey in his mind's eye. When Anakin was unconscious, Revan led a battle assault on the Star Forge, and when he attacked the Superstation, he was able to defeat his rivals. Bastila, who was turned to the dark side of the Force, used her battle meditation against the Republic forces. When Revan defeated Malak and confronted Bastila, he didn't want to kill her, so he gave her a chance of redemption if she used her battle meditation against the Sith forces, and she did. Revan and Bastila were able to escape, and in their escape, the Star Forge was destroyed for good. Revan showed the process of helping Skywalker heal from his injuries, and how he could overcome them, and then he exited Skywalker's mind. Skywalker's head recoiled, and he looked at Revan, his yellow tint disappearing from his eyes. Revan didn't remember much about Anakin, but he knew him. He knew he had him as a student of sorts, and he wanted to finish what he started. Being that Revan was able to overcome his stint in the dark side of the Force, he thought it was important to teach that to someone that he was informed was the chosen one. When Revan looked down at Anakin, he began to unlatch his restraints. The second Anakin's left arm was free, he stretched it out and Revan went flying across the room. Anakin's yellow eyes returned and Vader became hungry with power, reaching over and ripping the restraints off his robotic arm and off his legs as well. Revan got up slowly in the other room. After crashing through a wall, he typically wouldn't allow that to happen. He simply didn't expect it. Otherwise, he would have resisted it. But the strength of the Chosen One was building. The Sith holocrons he used and the knowledge he gained over the past year in the dark side with Malak and all the knowledge before that allowed him to feel confident enough to try and fight back against Revan. Once to his feet, Revan leapt back across the room, but Vader was gone. Revan looked around and then looked up. Vader had leapt into a ventilation shaft. Revan immediately called out a high security alert. Bastilla, who was meditating, trying to find peace again, opened her eyes to the rattle in her heart. She was startled by the sounds of the alarms and jolted up. When she opened the doors, she saw men running down the hallways and the lights flickering into a red dim. She asked what was happening, but none of the troops responded. When she saw Revan booking it down the hallway with another lightsaber in her hand, she looked at him and asked what it was. He told her that Skywalker escaped. Bastilla knew that wasn't good. She told Revan she would head for the bridge. Revan thought that'd be a good idea. He told her that their motive should be to immobilize him, to stop him from doing any damage, and then they could try and work on bringing him back to the light side of the force. She agreed, and the two of them split off. As Bastilla turned the corner, she heard blaster fire. The men were trying to subdue Skywalker, but even without a lightsaber, he had himself a weapon. It's called a wall. Vader ripped panels off of the wall and tossed them at the troopers, and used the walls to defend himself. Vader saw Bastilla and panicked. He remembered her ever so slightly from his fight with her and Malak. He knew she got lucky, but he didn't want to play that game with her again. Because she did, after all, cut off his forearm. Vader threw the panels at her and then turned around and ran away. She slid between the mass of panels and reached out with the force to catch him, but he slipped through her grip. She closed her eyes. She almost dug into the dark side again, but she couldn't. She didn't want to go back to the darkness, and upon the recoil, she fell to her knees. She heard her voice from behind her. It was Revan, and a couple of troops. He reached under her arm and asked if she was alright. She nodded her head and told him that Skywalker was escaping. She would be fine. Revan acknowledged what she said and jumped up to his feet and started running after Skywalker. He turned down the hallway and saw people burnt to a crisp and the robotic arm that was attached to Anakin's arm on the floor. 
Revan kept running, knowing that Vader would likely weaken himself. He'd been knocked out for little more than a couple of months. His life was completely sustained by his connection to the Force. Revan rounded the corner and saw Vader with a grappled tide around his neck. There were Republic troopers stunning him, but he wasn't stopping. All the adrenaline running through his system was keeping him going. Revan reached out with the Force and turned Skywalker's mind off with a flick of a switch, putting a blinding light in front of his eyes and sending him back into the dark abyss that was his mind. Revan told the men to release him, and they did. Revan picked up Skywalker and walked him back to the room they had him in originally. He buckled the young Sith down to the table and restricted him. Revan afterwards told the captain of the vessel to drop them off at a planet that was near their current location. The captain was confused, because the planet didn't always have much of a population, but Revan told him to do it anyways. Within a couple of hours, Revan, Bastilla, T3M4, and a still unconscious Anakin Skywalker landed. Revan had a plan in mind for this. Some of it was a little selfish on his part, but he believed it would work out favorably for all parties. Firstly, Revan wanted to make Skywalker stay away from all the affluence around the galaxy, and secondly, he wanted alone time with Bastilla. They were close, but they hadn't yet confessed their truest of feelings for each other. Bastilla wasn't entirely sure why Revan brought Skywalker here, but she trusted Revan's intuition. Having been the one that returned from the dark side himself, and saved her from the dark side of the Force, surely there could be something he could do to bring Skywalker back from the dark side. Revan set everything up in a small camp for the four of them, and then he took the medical table that Anakin was on and floated it out to the middle of the field and waited until Skywalker woke up. It took a couple of hours, and when Anakin woke up, he was furious. He began swinging from the second his eyes opened, and then he looked around to realize he was all alone. The fields were empty, and there was nothing but the echo of the whispering wind. His anger faded from his mind, and his eyes were filled with a terrible sadness. He looked out across the field, and then turned to the small mountain or rock formations around him. Vader put himself back on the table and looked around again, trying to find a means to escape. At this point, the planet of Lothal was occupied, and there was a city, but it was very small, very unoccupied at that. If anything, it was a foundational level of what could truly develop into a city and a population. However, it wasn't anything near where Skywalker was. He was left in an open field all alone. Vader, after looking around him, realized that he was all alone. It definitely hit him at home a little bit. Eleven years old and all alone after a life of what felt to be neglect. The darkness that filled his mind evaporated into a soulless echo. Vader's head fell back on the bed behind him, and he looked up into the sky. A Morai owl fluttered over him. Anakin, in all honesty, would like nothing better than to kill it, but he felt like he was melting, like his body would slip into the ground and vanish beneath the soil. His energy was gone. It wasn't from using the Force, but it was because he seemingly couldn't continue to do this. To keep feeling such rage and be filled with such anger and disappointment and regret and cowardice, Anakin in his mind felt like he was a coward for falling into the despair of the darkness. Maybe he was. Left alone with his own thoughts made him feel as such. He turned his head over and lifted his arm. His forearm was still missing, and nothing was left but the nub left behind by Malik's apprentice. Anakin felt back to that memory, the rage, the anger, all fueled by his resentment, and yet here he was, with nothing and no one. A life so short with nothing to show for himself. He was really the chosen one, or was he just a fraudulent concept invented by the Jedi so that Revan could drag him along with him? A way for the Jedi to not deal with him in hopes that Revan would forget him somewhere, or maybe something worse. But in reality, nothing was worse than what was done to him. There was nice moments, but it was filled with all neglect. An idea of maybe it wasn't so bad, but it was just longing for companionship, to have a friend or an idealistic version of a friend that never was. That was a worse suffering than death itself. Nothing to cap it off like Malik's intended usage of him, just to gripe for power only to realize that he was too insignificant in Malik's eyes. All that was longed for was a companion, but Malik wanted someone to rise into a Sith student, only for Malik to realize that Skywalker was stronger than he'd ever be. After all of his hard work and dedication, only for the Master to try and replace him by trying to kill him, and yet there was nothing to show for it. Malik was dead, Bastilla was a Jedi once more, and Skywalker was all alone on some planet remotely left in the galaxy. Revan from around the corner fell to his knees. He could feel the thoughts coursing through Anakin's mind. His hand was stretched outward and he slowly brought it back to his face, fearing that he was the creator of such a vile being, the creator of someone who had purity of heart but defined by the scars across his body. Bastilla stood behind Revan with a hand on his shoulder, feeling all the same raw emotions that he was feeling. She withheld tears from her eyes. Vader never wanted to become Vader. He just longed for the love he wanted, the love he deserved just as much as any other living being deserved it. Revan stood up, using the side of the rock to help himself up. And then when he took a step forward, Bastilla tightened her grip on his shoulder. He turned around with an inquisitive look in his eyes. She shook her head, suggesting that he shouldn't. Revan knew she had a point, but if they allowed Skywalker to dwell on his sadness, then he would surely become resentment 
and resent them if they revealed that they were here the entire time. She knew he was right, both of them had a great point, but the lesser of two of the evil options was confronting him now, rather than allowing him to dwell in his suffering all alone. Bastilla slowly took away her hand off of Revan's shoulder, and then he turned around and stepped out from behind the rock. Vader didn't hear him, and he continued to rummage through his thoughts all alone. Though, the forest was able to pick up on the sound of Revan's footsteps through the soft grass, so he leapt from his bed and turned around. Vader backpedaled, feeling cornered like a feral animal. He looked for something to defend himself with, but there was nothing. He put his hand out in front of him. Revan put both of his hands up, telling him that he didn't want to hurt him. Vader moved backwards, not trusting a single word he had to say. How could he? There was no way that he could trust him. Why would he? Revan dropped his lightsaber on the ground to show that it was safe. Vader could feel Bastilla's presence, and he turned his head looking for her. His skin trembled, his body ached. He hadn't had food in forever. He was being fueled by the Force. As a child, this should have killed him, but he was a chosen one. It was the only reason he was still alive. Anakin couldn't find Bastilla, and so he turned his eyes back to Revan, demanding to know where she was. The wicked woman cut his arm off, and he wasn't going to let it happen again, or worse. Revan told him that neither of them were trying to hurt him or here to hurt him. They were here to help him. Vader stopped in his tracks, looking at the two of them. T3M4 rolled up behind Revan with Vader's arm, the robotic one that is. Revan told Anakin that he could reattach his arm for him, but they needed to trust him. If he couldn't trust them, then this wouldn't work for anyone. Anakin nodded his head and reached out his arm, telling Revan to toss the robotic arm to him. Revan did so and asked Vader if they could talk. Anakin turned his head back and forth. There was nowhere for him to go. He could run, but that wouldn't get him anywhere. No weapon, exhausted and likely to die of starvation or dehydration. He needed Revan, but how could he trust someone who didn't give him a chance before? Revan spoke up. He said he was sorry for everything. He admitted his inability to remember what happened previously, but he told Vader that if he could do it all over again, he would have done it differently. Anakin shouted back, telling him that he was sure he would. Of course he would, because then he wouldn't have to deal with this dark side maniac on the other side of him. Anakin shouted at him, telling Revan that he just wanted a teacher and a friend and all he got was an abuser. A wave of shame crossed over Revan's body. He knew it, but he didn't. He understood Anakin's frustration, and so he put his hand out, telling Skywalker that they could start over again, right here and right now. It was all up to him if he wanted to partake in that. If he did, then surely they could make it work. Vader shook his head. He didn't know what to do. Revan took a step forward ever so slightly. Enough for Vader to see it, but not enough to make him feel like it was being threatened. Vader shook his head, but Revan took another step forward. Anakin's eyes were still yellow, but they weren't golden. It was a cross between yellow and blue, turning them to a yellowish green. Anakin stumbled backwards. Revan took some more steps until they were standing in front of each other. Revan got down onto his knees and slowly told Anakin to trust him. Anakin didn't want to. He couldn't. There was no feasible way for him to do so. Anakin told Revan that he didn't trust him or Bastilla, but he could try and stand them for a little bit. Revan told Anakin that's all he needed. There was no need to rush things. Anakin nodded his head. From around the corner, Bastilla came up from behind Revan. The sun was beginning to set on Lothal, and she had started a fire in their camp to keep them warm. Vader asked for his lightsaber, and Revan pulled it off his belt and tossed it in front of him. Anakin looked down at it as it creased the grass it lay in him. He picked it up and held it in his dominant arm, moving it back and forth. It felt so weird having to do it with the robotic arm. The weird thing is that the robotic arm made the weight of the blade feel lighter, but it's simply because the robotic arm was stronger than human flesh. Revan stood up and walked away from Anakin, telling him that whenever he was ready, there was food inside the camp. T3M4 followed Revan back to the camp and the three of them got themselves situated. Anakin stood alone for hours, thinking about everything. Thousands of thoughts crossed his mind, and yet he couldn't escape the confusion he felt about this entire situation. It was really weird. In a way, it was the most care he was ever shown by Revan. But Skywalker knew he couldn't just trust someone based on their words, he needed to see what their actions were. If the actions proved to be what their words said, maybe he could begin to trust them. He stayed away from the camp for hours, but he began to get cold. Wearing light garments at night, he was bound to get cold, and so he made his way for the camp. Bastilla and Revan were sitting next to each other, talking. When they saw Skywalker, they stopped, and they looked up at him. He slowly etched closer and closer to the fire and sat down in front of it without saying a word. They both smiled at him and continued their conversation. Revan, while in the middle of the conversation, got some food from a pack and walked it around the fire carefully and held out his hand towards Anakin. The boy took the food and demolished it. Revan told Anakin that the two of them were going for a hike in the morning and he asked if he would like to come along with them. He was certainly skittish, but he agreed to do so. The Jedi were looking for an ancient Jedi temple. 
the Jedi had been around for 22,000 years at this point. They had a temple here, and it would be worth their time to try and find the temple that was built here. Anakin nodded his head quietly. When the morning came, the trio and the droid went for a walk. They covered the plains, finding nothing. This exercise would carry on for weeks. In reality, Revan knew exactly where the temple was. However, the point of this harmless lie was to convince Skywalker to trust them. His eyes were still a yellowish green, but the natural blue color was beginning to shine through. During these couple of weeks, Anakin would turn 12 years old, and it would be celebrated by the two Jedi and the droid. Skywalker began to trust them a little bit, and his darkness faded. However, Revan made a point to tell Anakin that completely abolishing the darkness wouldn't exactly help him. Revan expressed that his usage of the dark side was helpful, but it wasn't reliant on it. Anakin listened in and learned. Over the past couple weeks, the two of them built up a bond. It was a lot different between the bond that Anakin and Bastila had. There was still some obvious tension considering she cut off his forearm. Her approach was similar to Revan's, but Anakin didn't remotely trust her like he kinda did Revan. Trusting Revan was kind of a stretch to say the least, but it was the closest word to me how he felt about it. In all honesty, it was almost entirely based on survival. He wouldn't be able to survive without either of the two of them, and it forced him into this situation. At first it felt like captivity, but shortly it became like a bond. Not tight, still loose, but something was framing. After Revan noticed this connection starting to form, he brought the Jedi to the temple here on the Thal. But he turned and told them that he couldn't open the temple without a student. He reached his hand out to Skywalker and asked Anakin's permission to teach him again. Anakin looked at the hand for a moment. He thought about it, and everything that had come before. Revan showed so much more attentiveness now than he did before. Originally, it felt like Revan just liked ranting about manifestos and idealism to him, but this Revan felt like he genuinely cared about him. So, in a leap of faith, he reached out his hand and took Revan's hand with his robotic arm. Revan smiled at Anakin, but there was still fear entrenched on Anakin's face. The poor boy looked like a grown man. His face had creases in it, and he wore his stress very heavily on himself. Revan turned with Skywalker and told him to reach out his hand and use a force to lift the massive structure. The two of them did, and the structure began to move. As it crawled up, an entrance was revealed, and the three Jedi walked in. Revan told Skywalker that when they got there, they would begin a meditation. Each of them individually would have their own visions of what they needed and how it would guide them on their next steps of the journey. Revan lightly placed his hand on Anakin's shoulder to see if he would get a negative reaction, but none came. As the two of them walked in with Bastila behind them, Revan told Anakin to trust the Force. What he saw would tempt him, it would scare him, and it would challenge him. All he needed to do was trust himself and the force around him and everything would be revealed. Anakin nodded his head. When he got in, he knelt down and waited. He felt the force crushing down and around him. And before he knew it, he was the first one gone. Anakin was led down a path. He could see Malak in front of him. Then behind Malak was a voice he'd only heard once, a menacing voice that called out to him, requesting him to return to the darkness. When Skywalker turned away from the voice, he was confronted by three villains. They were all standing before him, and they were menacing. One was massive, the other was old, and the third was not present. He was, but he wasn't. It was weird. Something created by Malakor when Revan defeated Mandalore the Ultimate. Regardless, Skywalker denied their call to him. He denied their strength, and he denied their influence. Skywalker fell to his knees and they vanished. A voice called out to Anakin. He looked up and saw an older man. He'd never seen this man before. And the man told Anakin that he embodied what a Jedi truly was. His path had yet been decided, but what he truly desired could be his if he embraced the path before him. The night was always darkest before the dawn. If Skywalker carried on this path, then he would surely reach what it was he truly desired. The man then vanished. Anakin wanted to know who he was, but he didn't have time. He exited the division and found himself outside the temple. Sitting next to him were people with him, but they were dead. The vision wasn't gone. He looked up into the fiery skies of desolation. Revan spoke to Skywalker with his dying breath, asking that he bring balance to the Force so that this pain could never be experienced again. Anakin jolted up inside the temple. He looked around. Revan and Bastila were gone. His heart was racing, and he slowed himself down and looked around. He closed his eyes and he meditated, waiting for the other two to return from their visions. When they did, they left the temple with a whole new perspective. While Revan and Bastilla's visions were equally as tantalizing, a lot of pressure sat on Skywalker's shoulders. He was 12, but he felt like he had to bring balance to the Force all by himself, which was far from the truth. He just needed to trust the Force and the two adults that were with him, and he would find his path. Revan and Bastilla both came to the conclusion that it was time to move on from Lothal to another planet around the galaxy. The Sith were going to emerge soon, and the Jedi had to stop them. While Revan, Bastilla, and Anakin weren't Jedi, it was the closest faction to what they really were. Though before they left, 
Revan and Bastilla admitted their truest feelings for each other, and then decided that despite their feelings, they should sideline them for the time being, putting off an eventual marriage and focus on what lay before them, the Chosen One and bringing balance to the Force. They both agreed, and it would be better for them to focus on the greater threat to the galaxy rather than what they individually wanted. It was a sacrifice, but a sacrifice that would be worthwhile. The three Jedi then departed back to Coruscant. The reason for doing so was that they could learn where the Sith were, or if the Sith were still around. Skywalker had been to Coruscant since he was an infant, and when he saw the Grand City, he was amazed. It was the most incredible sight he'd ever seen. The Skywalkers touched the sky, and the world felt surreal. Anakin since Lothal had mellowed out some. There was still a lot of rage that existed within his soul and within his being, but he was able to control it. He had Revan, and the slightest of teachings were already having an effect on him. When the Jedi got there, it was obvious the Council wasn't fond of Revan or Bastila, considering they were kind of rebels. While they hadn't yet married, it wasn't hard to pick up on the bond that existed between the two of them. The Council couldn't just accuse them of having a bond, but they could disperse the three of them to a part of the galaxy. So that's what they did, telling them that there were reports of the Sith in the Outer Rim, and dispatching the Jedi back out there to where they previously were. Revan, during this time, began to have nightmares of the Sith. Currently, they were fragments of Revan's former Sith Empire bouncing around. However, there was a lot of infighting going on between the Sith. The trio left Coruscant, Revan believing that their fight would be useless without Skywalker receiving the training he needed. Instead of searching for the Sith, Revan took Skywalker and Bastila to Yavin 4 to complete Anakin's training. Revan by this point had become aware of the neglect his student faced for the first part of his life, and he wanted to right those wrongs. Yavin 4 would be a great place to do that, as long as they stayed clear of Exar Kun's temple and the dark aura left behind by him. When they arrived on Yavin, they set up a camp, and Revan told Anakin what they were doing here. At this point, Revan made it clear that Skywalker would have to trust Bastila at some point, and it would go a long way in helping him overcome the dark side of the Force. He understood, but he told him that it was hard. He tried to trust her, but every time he looked at his arm, he was reminded by what she did to him. Revan understood his student's pain and told him that they would work on it together. Anakin at this point was easing himself away from the dark side and finally embracing a healthy balance in the Force, finding happiness and peace. Revan worked with Skywalker and in this moment he was able to embrace the balance. As a preteen, it was difficult to do but he listened to Revan and came to terms with his past, accepting that it had happened but it was time to move on. Revan's big philosophy was that while yes it was difficult and it was hard, he wouldn't be here without that past. He wouldn't have conquered and overcome without those memories, without those hardships. Revan and Anakin were currently atop of an ancient pyramid on the planet, and they were seated overlooking the scenery. Revan truthfully apologized for everything that had become of their past relationship. Their past was riddled with terrible times, and it was a shared pain. Revan had apologized before, but in this moment, a heart to heart, he was able to communicate it the best way he could. He felt truly sorry, and he never wanted Skywalker to be left on his own again. In a way, Revan embodied a neglectful father figure, but in the end, at this moment, he embraced the role that he was meant to fill for his young student, not just a teacher and not just a mentor, but a familiar role. Anakin had kind of come around to Bastilla, but it was still hard. In this moment, Anakin and Revan hugged it out, and they moved on from their past, accepting it for what had happened but not letting it control their present selves. The two of them moved past their usage of the Force and worked on their usage of the lightsaber. Revan used Form 4, but Skywalker from his time with Malak fell into Form 5. Of course it was something that he wanted to stick with, but being that they had different lightsaber forms, it allowed both of them to gain something entirely from their training. Anakin still refused to train with Bastilla, which Revan completely understood. However, he was slowly trying to push Anakin into trusting Bastilla. Not that he would spar with her, but in all simplicity, accept her and trust her. After someone cuts off your forearm, it's kind of hard to see them as friendly, especially since Anakin was still so young. Though their time on Yavin would last for a number of years, Anakin began to rather age quickly, and without feeling a constant state of depressive influence stress, he was able to heal and grow a little more naturally. His relationship with Revan was a very important part of his growth. Without it, he would have likely been very neglectful to the idea of growing. Bastila usually kept her distance from Skywalker for the most part. She wanted to befriend him and have a bond with him, but she also didn't want to scare him back into his rage and into the dark side. Likely she wouldn't be capable of doing that to Anakin, but she also still had that fear of doing it. Revan and Skywalker would climb the pyramids on Yavin every day for a meditation at sunset, and then when it was dark, they would spar. Their lightsabers no longer crimson. Skywalkers had just been purified, but it wasn't white. Rather, it was amethyst, just like the weapon that belonged to his master. When Anakin was 17 years old in the year 3950 BBY, he and Bastila connected. They spent four years on Yavin and Revan turned Skywalker into an absolute beast. Anakin was deadly as Vader when he was 11, but as a 17 year old he had the power that could rival that 
that of the entire Council of the Jedi. This particular year was very special. The Sith Civil War had come to a close and the Sith Triumvirate had dissipated with the rest of the Sith. Without Revan, it was much more difficult of an undertaking for Metra Suk, but the group of Jedi were able to stop the Triumvirate and the other Sith. There was still a Sith that remained, but at this moment it seemed like the Sith had been erased from the galaxy. Bastilla and Revan hadn't yet fully gone into their love, and having held back, they didn't yet have a child, essentially taking Anakin as their own. However, Anakin and Bastilla were able to finally build up a relationship. It wasn't easy, but it finally came together. It started when Anakin told Revan that he wanted to train with Bastilla for a day. She was very caught off guard by it, but she was incredibly nervous the entire time. She really wanted to be the best teacher she could be for Skywalker, but she felt like she would fail him by being herself. Anakin finally came around to her, accepting his past with her and fully allowing himself to move on. It was very tense, very robotic. She had a very different perspective on everything, but she genuinely was afraid of reminding him of their first encounter. After a full day with each other, they had a talk that resulted in an understanding. She told Anakin that she wanted to be whatever he needed her to be and without a response he embraced her in a massive hug. It was a moment of vulnerability on both of their parts for the first time with each other. The two of them sat at the top of the same pyramid and had a very nice conversation and just as the sun went down, the two of them ignited their weapons and had a spar. It was a very lovely spar but it was tense at first. The last time they fought, Bastila cut Anakin's face and his arm off. So she was a bit fearful, but they got into a rhythm and then they were able to have a spar at full speed. Bastila really enjoyed this because she felt welcomed into Anakin's life and she felt like she could truly contribute to him as an individual. The three of them would begin training together consistently, however after Anakin expressed his fondness with both of them, Revan and Bastila consecrated their relationship. The two of them married on Yavin 4 and T3 and Anakin were there for it joyfully. It was a beautiful private ceremony for the two of them to enjoy their marriage. Though there was something bothering Revan. He had been having nightmares about a bad place. He wasn't sure what or where it was. But Revan explained it to Skywalker. Anakin told him he knew exactly what it was. Skywalker got shivers just thinking of it, but he explained that when Anakin was just a boy about seven years before, they went to the planet of Droman Kraz for about a couple months. When they left, Revan, Malak, and himself were servants of the dark side. Skywalker told the two of them that he wasn't sure if he himself was ready to confront the Sith Emperor. They looked at each other and then back to him asking why that was. As Skywalker explained that Vitiate was building an army, he was strong with the dark side and the last time they went there, he was able to flip their world upside down, turning Revan into a servant of the dark side, and creating an army that only fell apart this year. It took seven years to get over what he turned them into, and it cost the life of Malak. If they failed again, then there would be no force in the entire galaxy that could stop the three of them, especially being that Anakin was so strong as a boy, not to mention how strong he would become if he was possessed as a young man. The two of them understood the point he was making, but if the Sith Emperor was so powerful, they had to confront him, because if they didn't, the galaxy wouldn't be able to survive an encounter with him. Anakin understood, but he told Revan and Bastilla that he needed more training. He wasn't yet at the level he needed to be. Revan thought for a moment, and then he told Skywalker that they would return to Coruscant and have Anakin challenge the entire Jedi Council. If he could defeat them, then he would be confirmed ready to take on the Sith Emperor. Anakin nodded his head and thought that, in all fairness, it would be the best comparison of power for him. The three of them and T3 departed for Coruscant, and when they arrived at the Council Chamber, Skywalker just stood before them and challenged the entire Council to a spar, telling them that it was his greatest trial. The council saw no reason to decline in the challenge, and so they did so, going into the training arena and fighting with the Chosen One himself. The council consisted of 13 members, and they all immediately ignited their weapons, challenging the Chosen One and fighting with them. Anakin's speed was faster than the eye could catch, even for more experienced Force users. Being trained in balance of the Force, his most natural state, he was able to outmatch just about anyone. Anakin, having spent so much time in the state of perpetual darkness, was empowered by the strength of the Force when he utilized its balance. He moved around flawlessly, blocking and countering where he could. Bastilla and Revan had trained him well, and they were watching from the side. Skywalker lifted members off their feet with the force and within 20 minutes, he was the sole victor among the High Council. Some of the members were outraged, some were disappointed in themselves, and the rest were inspired and impressed. How could they not be impressed? They were the best Jedi had to offer, and they were dispatched like they were nothing. The Council wanted to offer Skywalker a spot on the High Council and even give him the rank of Master for his prowess in the force. 
course, but he politely declined it. His ideals didn't line up with the Order or the Council itself, and he believed that sitting on the Council would only steal away his ability to harmonize with the Force. He preferred where he stood, especially since the Council agreed to disagree with Revan and Bastilla's marriage. Their arrangement was that the two of them could keep their relationship, however, they were not permitted to share their ideals with anyone else within the Jedi Order. Regardless, after Skywalker obliterated the High Council, he felt the confidence to try and face Vitiate. However, they would do it on his terms. Draman Kaas was a very dark place, and they would have to go in with everything they had. If not, then they would suffer for it. Skywalker told the two of them his plan. On the day they arrived on the planet, Skywalker turned 18. What a special day for him to face down his truest rival in the Force. Before they approached the throne room, Bastila closed her eyes and focused on the Force, and used battle meditation to surround them and protect them with the Force. It would be the extra boost they needed. When they were surrounded by the Force, the three of them went in. However, Skywalker placed himself behind Bastila and Revan, hiding his body behind them. When the Jedi broke into the throne room after killing multiple guards, Bastila and Revan walked side by side to the throne itself. Vitiate didn't move. The Sith Emperor simply smiled. He told them that they made a terrible mistake by returning. He raised his hands and threw them forward, using Force Drain to steal their Force Essence. The moment he did that, he saw Skywalker. The Chosen One leapt over the two Jedi and whipped his lightsaber across the room at the Sith Emperor. Vitiate lifted one hand and stopped the blade before it collided with him. The moment Skywalker hit the ground, he threw both of his hands forward and shot Vitiate through the throne room with the largest gust of the Force he could ever use. Both Revan and Bastila fell backwards and Skywalker's lightsaber fell. He used the Force and pulled it into his hand and then he ran forwards. The Sith Emperor was getting up on the back side of the throne room. It was situated on a plateau above the city. Vitiate stumbled backwards. Skywalker was pressing a heavy assault, but the Sith Emperor used his lightning to defend himself. The fight was very intense, entirely based around who could land the first blow. If Skywalker could land the first blow, he would win. But if Vitiate could stop Skywalker, then he could send all of his minions onto the Jedi and destroy them. Anakin bashed his blade down, swinging for the killing blow but missing. Vichyte shot lightning at Skywalker again. Anakin spun around and using electric judgment for the first time by accident, as yellow lightning trickled out of his hands and they slapped the Emperor across the chest and he stumbled back. Revan and Bastila came running out of a hole left behind by Skywalker and they called out his name. He stopped and looked down at Vitiate. He knew that giving into his anger would lead to the dark side. He held his blade back and stopped. Vitiate grinned and rolled off the edge, but before he could escape and go anywhere, Skywalker reached out with a force and stripped the Emperor's ability to use a force from his body. The amount of power taken in by Skywalker sent a recoil into his body and he shot backwards. Luckily, he was caught by Revan and Bastila. The Sith Emperor, without the ability to use a force, crashed into the ground and died on impact. His death, marking the definitive end of the Sith. The buildings around the city on Dremen Kaz began to rip apart. Revan helped Skywalker up as they looked over the edge and watched everything deteriorate. Revan told Skywalker he was proud of him. Anakin smiled at him. Bastila came up to Anakin's other side with her hand on his back and told him that she too was incredibly proud of him. As the city and the Sith Empire began to crumble, L3 rolled up in command of their vessel and picked them up, escaping the planet and the death of the Sith. As the Jedi returned to Coruscant, they informed the Council of their victory over the Sith. Revan and Bastilla would retire away, remaining as Jedi loosely and starting a family, one that would have a long-standing legacy within the halls of the Jedi Order, with their descendants of course. As for Anakin, he would begin instructing students inside the Jedi Temple. Of course, being that he was Anakin, he had his own intentions. He would continue the lessons that his masters taught him, but he would keep it hidden from the High Council. In due time, when Skywalker was given the opportunity to join the ranks of the High Council, he would accept it. When he reached the pinnacle of power in the Order, he would continue to pass on his lessons to the Jedi around him, giving them all a new sense of inspiration and understanding of the Code and of the Force. Skywalker would return to Lothal throughout his career as a Jedi to interact more with the Force essence that gave life to the first Jedi. And while the Jedi Chosen One brought balance to the Force, there would be imbalance throughout history, as nothing can ever remain perfect. However, with the destruction of the Sith and a new legacy of teachings in the Jedi Order, true evil would never rise again. I love you all. I hope you all enjoyed this story. It was a lot of fun to do. If you want more Old Republic videos, you know what to do. Smash the like button. Otherwise, I love you all. Spread the love. And always remember, my friends, may the Force be with you.